even if you have the best business idea in the world and you're good at what you're doing, if you don't know how to hire, if you have constant turnover, your business is only going to go so far. All right, folks, thanks for coming back with me here, the High Voltage Business Builders Podcast. I have a good uh, contact for you today, uh, someone who's very experienced in both Amazon selling, outsourcing, business building, exiting companies, and from what I understand, is just an uh, all-around genuine guy. Uh, he and I have not had a lot of time to interact with each other, so this is going to be probably the longest we've ever spent talking today. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation, and you guys are going to listen in, and we're going to talk about all those things and more, I'm sure. Nathan, thanks for joining the call, bud. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sorry we haven't uh, spent more time together. Oh, well, I blame you, so let's just get that out of the gate. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then from there, uh, yeah, I'll take my hit. Um, but you have had uh, definitely some experience selling on Amazon. Some of those folks are here. Of course, we've got a lot of people in the e-com world uh, from various DTC, et cetera. What was your experience selling on Amazon, just to get that out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, I started selling back in 2008. I was a college kid that discovered drop shipping after selling some textbooks and creating an Amazon seller account. And this was before courses and consultants and Facebook groups and masterminds and conferences, like none of that stuff existed. All the course so, selling, yeah. Yeah, so I it was a lot of experimenting, a lot of trial and error, the, the wild, wild west of Amazon. And we sold about 25 million from 2008 to, to 2015. And uh, learn, learned a lot, learned a lot of what not to do as well. And it was kind of my, my first baby, my first glimpse into to being an entrepreneur. Good. So some folks that are listening to this are evaluating, thinking, deciding, is this a channel I want to work in? And others are already working in that process. What would you tell either side of that from your experience? I mean, 25 million is not anything to shake a stick at, right? Um, pros and cons, goods and bads. Would you do it again? Would you not do it again? Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, would I do it again at the time? Yeah, it was a great kind of cash cow and doing it before everyone else is doing it. I like to kind of get into spaces while other people are, are not doing it. Um, like, for example, free up, like when I started that, which is a marketplace for agencies, freelancers and virtual assistants, there weren't a lot of like service providers for e-commerce sellers. Like now there's a lot of agencies, but that didn't really exist back then. And back then with Amazon, I had to be one of the first a thousand US Amazon sellers. And I mean, now there, there's tons and it's very saturated. So you can you can definitely make money on it. It's it's a it's a real business that's going to take the time and work of a real business. And there there's market research, there's trial and error, there's business decisions and hiring decisions and strategy decisions. So it's not the the get rich quick thing that that it maybe was at one point, but there's still a gigantic opportunity. And and there's also a reason why. With our, our bookkeeping service, where we're targeting e-commerce sellers, because it's a booming space, and more and more people are becoming sellers, and sellers are growing. So it's not over by by any means, but you have to take it with the the right approach. I'm glad to hear you say that because if Voltage does that. I mean, we we build and we grow and we scale, and I, everyone needs to understand these are real businesses. You got to spend the time, the money, and the activity. And of course, products and research are very important, and market research, as you mentioned, is extremely important. So we go down those and. Uh, it's very interesting to hear you say that. Not many people speak about it as a real business. They think about Amazon as a single channel, side hustle, hobby business. And, you know, we can debunk that today because it's not actually how it works, not reality. Not unless you want to go break the terms of service, right? And go play in the wholesale FBA dropshipping model in Amazon today, because now you're going to be totally hosed up. But you moved on, you said to free up. You obviously got into outsourcing. You went, it sounds like, from being the miner to selling shovels to miners a little bit, if I'm not, and I don't mean that derogatory. <laughs> But you moved into the services space for e-com, which I think is smart um, because, as you mentioned, there is a lot of opportunity in e-com. What was the defining moment? Like why? I mean, you said there was an opportunity. Was it just people in your network? Was it an, uh, you, you followed a trend? You just saw this you know, thing or you just love the outsourcing world? Yeah. So, I mean, at first we were hiring a lot of college kids to help with our Amazon business. I, I ran the business out of a frat house, if you can imagine how crazy uh, that was. And uh, we learned a lot. I mean, Connor, my, my longtime business partner. Uh, was a really great college hire that was lucky because I didn't really have a good hiring process. And I made a lot of bad college hires as well. And they were very unreliable. I remember banging on people's dorm room. I mean, I was 20, 21. So it's tough for me to fathom hiring adults that were 40. To, and, and a lot of them didn't really know what e-commerce was. So we kind of turned to VAs and freelancers out of necessity to to get help for this business that was growing. And I ended up building a really great hiring process that took years to, to develop. And we had a, a rock star team. And as Amazon was getting harder, I also started to just network with other Amazon sellers, which again was a, a brand new thing that didn't happen for the first few years that, that I was with Amazon seller. So talking to them, 
they had the same hiring processes and it started off like, hey, can I lease your graphic designer? Can I lease your Amazon lister? Can I lease your customer service rep? And and that kind of gave us the idea for for starting our own marketplace free up. And we launched it with a minimum viable product, a, a software that did very little. And it quickly took off and surpassed our, our Amazon sales. And it was kind of a exciting time for us because we were doing B2B for the first time, building a brand for the first time, having our own website, learning SEO and partnerships and podcasts and all the stuff that, that goes with it. And we, we definitely like that more personally opposed to selling products. It's more of just a, a personal preference. Um, but yeah, we, we started to scale that and focus our efforts and decided to scrap the Amazon business as it got harder to, to focus on free. So you're putting people basically who are in the e-com world together with trained um, VAs? Uh, if I'm not mistaken. So we didn't train them. Okay. Our motto was we would get thousands of applicants every week and we'd vet them and the top 1% would get on our platform. And from a client side, free to sign up, they put in a request, tell us what they need. We match it up, all billings through the platform and 100% customer service guarantee. If anything, even the smallest thing goes wrong, we make it right quickly, no questions asked. So people would have a lot of confidence in, confidence in their hires. So with those who are hiring, what are some of the biggest type of roles they're looking to fill right now in terms of uh, replacement resources, if you will, or extending their time into somebody else? I mean, a, a lot of the same stuff that people were hiring for five years ago is the same today. You've got customer mm. service reps, especially people for um, like to have Shopify businesses more than more than Amazon. You've got people who know PPC, freelancers and agencies. You've got uh, people who are great at, at listing and writing content. Um, you've got people who are good at graphic design and, and videos for people's listings and overall Amazon experts to come in and diagnose the problem. A lot of those um, th those roles that you just need in your Amazon business if you want to have success because you can't yeah. master or do every little thing is, is very relevant even today. Oh, very much so. And as you mentioned, it's a business. So as, as businesses go along, you have to replicate yourself through SOPs or you know standard operating procedures, which I'm sure you understand. But for those who may be new to this, you've got to replicate yourself. And it's actually one of the Achilles heels of most entrepreneurial people, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, most, most entrepreneurs, they don't focus on the what I call the two unsexy parts of business, which is the finance and the hiring. And if you're if you don't understand your numbers and you're not making decisions off numbers, very tough to scale. If you can't, even if you have the best business idea in the world and you're good at what you're doing. If you don't know how to hire, if you have constant turnover, your your business is only going to go so far. And th there's so many things you don't need to learn as an entrepreneur. Like you don't need to master writing listings and and being a PPC expert and sourcing products. Like sure, if you're great at one of those things, it, it only helps you. But at some point, you can't become an expert at every little part of your business. So you have to learn how to delegate and you have to learn how to hire effectively. Yeah, no, that's very well said. Again, back to that real business, which I love because I've very uh, infrequently get people who understand in this world of e-commerce what a true business actually looks like. Um, and, you know, you get that in other angles of business and folks I talk to because there's different scales and economies of scales, of course, across different businesses. But um, on the e-com side, you see a lot of ready, fire, aim uh, in this world, <laughs> which doesn't lead people to, you know, some of the opportunities are missed, frankly, uh, because they haven't been taught or don't understand, or maybe they just took a course and it didn't really help them understand why they chose the products. Now, the three that you particularly uh, angled in on, I think, are great. Maybe we can talk about those for a second. Product research uh, was definitely one of them. PPC was one of them. And listings. Uh, why did you pick on those three? I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's more of just running free up for four years. Those were probably the most common requests that we would get if you would check out yeah. the job board and see what people needed. Um, it's also stuff that like doesn't really go away. Um, like PPC is still PPC listing go away. people need. You need customer service in every business yeah. I've ever run. So, um, yep. it, it's kind of the, the standard roles. But I mean, th there's other stuff too. You get VAs who are good at at going through wholesale lists, for example, and finding profitable products, which needs really good SOPs and, and directions. Um, you have people that, that help build email lists and especially with Shopify, the, the marketing behind that and running Facebook ads. So yeah. there, there's plenty of other roles. Those are just kind of maybe the top ones that come to my mind. So where do you primarily find folks who become good VAs? Where are you? Are you sourcing from all the world? Is there a specific location? Like how, uh, what do you find? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't do this anymore because I, I exited free up in 2019. But You said that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I mean, our marketplace was about 40% Philippines, 40% US and 20% scattered around the world. Um, part of that's by design just because we, we know a lot of people in the Philippines and have a lot of um, just resources and connections there. And part of it's a little bit random of who actually applies and, and gets onto the, the platform. But 
Like even Econ Balance today, it's a hybrid of US people here in Denver, high level bookkeepers and high level bookkeepers in the Philippines. And it's kind of the, the best of both worlds where the clients get fair prices. And, and from our side, um, it helps for economies of scale. So you've shifted gears just a little bit and went from what appears to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of more of the you know tactical aspects of the e-com world, uh, listing, product creation, customer service, et cetera, into the financial side uh, more. Is that correct? Yeah. So we exited free up at the end of 2019, which was kind of a crazy time to, to sell a business. The original, original plan was to take a few years off and travel the world. Uh, COVID kind of made it so we were stuck inside with no business to run and, and nothing to do. And you can only watch so much Netflix. So uh, we we kind of got out there and, and built Outsource School, which is our hiring course. We teach people how we interview, onboard, train, and manage. And we still run that to this day. It kind of bought us some time to figure out what we really want to do next. And through a lot of bad brainstorming and um, different ideas thrown around and, and market research, we, we really like the, the bookkeeping space. I mean, we credit um, bookkeeping to being a big part of how we've scaled our businesses, making good decisions each month, um, selling the company, passing due diligence. And the big question is, is there a market? Is there a need or is it saturated? And, and from our market research, we found a, a big market and some potential to to do it differently because we're entrepreneurs first and e-commerce sellers first. We're, we're not bookkeepers. So we're, we're good at hiring bookkeepers, but we know what entrepreneurs want and what they need and how to put things in a way that it's easy for them. So that's kind of the approach we've taken for the past nine, 10 months as we, as we build this up. Yeah, as I constantly say to people, build uh, with the end in mind from the very beginning. And that is, of course, putting great bookkeeping in place and knowing your numbers, as you mentioned, we say by the numbers here, and obviously knowing your quarterly cash flows and your annual run rates and having good projections and, and running the business by the numbers, which so many sellers don't seem to catch on to that. So we're going to keep hammering that. Uh, for people who are in startup or somewhere in the middle or, you know, are growing a business, getting the numbers is important. Um, so which particular area of focus are you really hammering down through this year and into 2023 as we're currently recording this? It's around October. Uh, this will probably release in, an, in another month or so. So as you're listening to this, uh, folks, right now, we're probably in the height of e calm season uh, heading into the fourth quarter. Um, what are you focused on? What's your, what's your, what do you see in your CEO crystal ball hat for the next year? Yeah, I mean, we're kind of in an exciting time with, with Econ Balance because we've got a great team. We've got a few players that we need to add in terms of, of like client onboarding and stuff like that. But our, our teams in place, our process are built out. There's some tweaking and fine tuning. But now is kind of the, the fun part for Connor and I, which is the, the scaling and the marketing and the brand awareness and um, the customer experience and making sure that we tweak that to, to make sure people are, are 100% happy. So that's kind of, we've kind of put in that work over the past 10 months. Hopefully we're at a good place and can start that, that scaling mode. Uh, we've got about 11 bookkeepers and 90 clients. The time is scaling this. So our goal is to get over a hundred by the end of the year, but get to a thousand um, long-term. That's kind of our, our goal. So well, um, that and the, the growth of outsource school is kind of our, our main focus right now. So if someone engages with you on that, what's the process look like? If I'm already got a bookkeeper or I don't have bookkeeping, just walk me through it. So if someone's listening, they kind of get a, an idea, a visual into my movie of what, how they'd work with you. Yeah, you create an account on our site. It'll ask you some questions about your business and get us access to your current books. We'll get you a quote. That quote will be two things, a fixed price for any kind of setup, catch up, clean up, and then a monthly fixed price uh, of what your price will be going forward. We charge you on the first, you get your books by the 15th, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow along with great customer service to, to help you along the way. We don't do any tax. We communicate directly with your CPA, but that's pretty much the, the process. Cool. Does people, do people integrate their seller accounts with you? Say if they're on Amazon or something, do they integrate that to pull data automatically or do they have to do it themselves? So we use a tool called A2X and that will connect it to any marketplace you have and connect that directly to QuickBooks or Xero. Those are the, the two bookkeeping softwares we're compatible with. So all of that, if you agree to our quote, we walk you through that during integration. It's pretty quick and easy and makes it so we can get accurate data and, and get you accurate data. Very, very cool, man. So if you had a couple of things, like there's two kinds of avatars we're talking about. Someone who's just getting started or thinking, hey, I'm going to do this and I want to get my books right. And then there's a person who's already doing it. Let's speak to each of those for just a second. Um, the first person getting started, what are maybe the top three things they need to know, bring to the table or have aware in their mind as they're going to start putting some bookkeeping together with you guys? Yeah. So my overall mentality is as an entrepreneur, you should never do your own bookkeeping. Uh, one, it's just not a good use of your time. Your, your time is much better spent growing your business, making strategic decisions, hiring, whatever it is. 
And second of all, most entrepreneurs are not good at bookkeeping and any work that you do just has to get redone later and cleanup work always costs more than just doing it right from um, day one. So even if you're small, hire a bookkeeper from day one. It's one of the best business decisions I ever made when we started free up, just even before we were profitable, getting good monthly reports, making decisions on the real numbers. Um, that's kind of the mentality. And if you're a newer seller, you should get in the mentality that you need either QuickBooks or Zero. Those are the main two accounting softwares, along with A2X, which is good for connecting to the marketplaces. Um, you also should set yourself up to, to make it simple. That means having a business bank account, a business credit card, ideally one that allows view only access so you don't have to download statements every single month. Um, make sure you're not intermingling personal and business because that's a nightmare for your bookkeeper and it will get you a lot in a lot of trouble uh, with the IRS. And the, it's, it's those basic setup things that are just going to make it easy for any bookkeeper to, to work with you. And even if you're hiring a, a cheap bookkeeper to start and upgrading later, that, that's still usually better than, than doing it yourself. It's something that should be off your plate. Yeah. And it's a serious business move, right? I mean, as we, as we're talking about building a business here, there are concepts once again, that I can't do everything. I may want to use the house analogy. Like I'm not a concrete guy. So if we're going to go put a foundation in, I'm not the guy that you want to go out and lay concrete. <laughs> same, same deal here, but I still see a lot of entrepreneurs thinking that they can do that. Uh, or that they're going to cut costs or, or this kind of thing. And, and guys, this is a big warning uh, you're hearing here from Nathan. And I've, I've echoed it before on other podcasts and videos. You know, don't you cannot do all things, as I've said, uh, and you can't ride all those horses. You only got one seat. So uh, make sure you understand where to focus your time and energy and effort. And Nathan, you, you hit it right there. What are the revenue generating activities that you should be actually focused on? Uh, building the business, product research focus, um, brand focus, market uh, research and segmentation and, and marketing should be the big things that you're looking for. Uh, anything else that uh, somebody's already selling and, and wants to move? Wh why would they move? Why would they take the time and effort, Nathan, to switch from a current situation to you? Yeah, so it could be a bunch of things. I mean, one, a lot from our market research, a lot of people use bookkeepers that don't understand e-commerce. Like, for example, they might use the amount that's deposited in your bank account as the top line in your income statement when that's just not correct. There's Amazon sales and fees and all the stuff that goes underneath it. Um, you might have people that are doing inventory or cost of goods wrong. Um, you might have bookkeepers that are only set up for cash basis when if you're trying to sell your business or really understand your numbers, you, you really need to be set up as accrual. Um, or you just need better segmentation where if you're selling different SKUs, you want to be able to see how each SKU is doing, different brands, same thing, different marketplaces. And it's, uh, there are plenty of sellers who might be selling five products, but only one of them is profitable and they have no idea if it's all lumped together into one thing. So just a, a few things to, to kind of keep in mind as an e-commerce seller, you want a bookkeeper that, that knows e-commerce and understands e-commerce. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, look, Nathan obviously knows this stuff. Uh, if you're interested in that bookkeeping, go to ecombalance.com, if I'm not mistaken, yep. uh, and make sure you check that out maybe have a call with them, figure out what they're doing, see what the value might be of changing or starting, uh, with your bookkeeping, as we've said, uh, and hopefully you're listening to this, you will want to start bookkeeping. Uh, even if you started in perfectly, uh, you want to have something done in which you can control your numbers and know the cash flow, know the money in, know the money out and understand how to properly account for cost of goods, for fees and other things that most people miss. Uh, and then four to five months into the sales, Nathan, I'm sure you know this, they figure out it's not profitable. The product really isn't working great. And a dollar in profit per unit uh, is not a business make, even on volume. <laughs> <laughs> so any final parting words that you'd love to give everybody here before we cut out? No, I mean, we, we covered a lot of it. Go to econbalance.com, get two months free, go to Outsource School. You get a 30% discount if you mention this podcast. And um, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Feel free to connect with me, Nathan Hirsch, yeah. on any social media channel, even if um, if I can help you, which has nothing to do with hiring or bookkeeping. Great talking to you, brother. Thanks for coming on. You too.